Hello, my name is Frank Walker. I'm an historian associated with the Orange County Historical Society of Orange, Virginia and the James Madison Museum. This particular video is about George Washington and his women. Uh, I have selected four ladies uh, that I know contributed enormously to the George Washington of history uh, and I'm going to take them in order. Uh, Mother Mary, wife Martha, sister Betty, and good friend Sally. Uh, before I start, I really, as sort of an honorable mention, I need to acknowledge Francis Alexander, Betty Fauntleroy, and Mary Eliza Phillips, all three of whom, I understand, we understand, turned down offers of marriage from George Washington. <laughs> uh, why they might have done so uh, will probably be more apparent as we move along. So we begin with mother. I sometimes irreverently but respectfully call her mama. And this is probably her late teens, early 20s, but indeed it is not taken from life. In fact, there is no image of Mary Ball Washington from life. Uh, don't know why, because certainly uh, she was famous by, the, by her later years, but maybe she didn't like the way she looked. Born in Northampton County around uh, 1708. Her father was Colonel Joseph Ball, who was a widower with five children, her mother was Mary Johnson, a widow with two children. And I guess if you are born into that kind of arrangement, it doesn't seem at all confusing, and uh, that's the way life goes. But for Mary, it didn't stay that way. It didn't stay unconfusing. At roughly age three, her father died. Her mother then soon remarried. Then one of her half-brothers, died, then her stepfather died, then just as Mary was going into her teen years, her mother died, and Mary was now an orphan. Mary's mother did two things for her that we have to give credit for. One is she saw to her daughter getting at least a rudimentary education, reading, writing, not at a very high level, but reading and writing and some calculating. She also, in her will, provided that if Mary were left an orphan uh, below the age of, of maturity, that Colonel George Eskridge would be her guardian. Eskridge was a kinsman at some, at some level, I don't know how close, but he was a kinsman, and he was a highly acclaimed, highly respected attorney. His specialty was colonial law, and his opinion was sought on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, he served uh, on occasion uh, as a judge. He was asked also on other occasions to serve as the king's attorney. Uh, he was a very influential member of the House of Burgesses. He was indeed a militia officer and he was also a land speculator and a planter at one time owning roughly 12,000 acres of land in his own name. Now at the time Eskridge took over the guardianship of Mary he was in his early 60s and sort of riding the crest of his career. He put Mary and one of her half-sisters into a home. We don't know how much more he did than to make sure that they were comfortable. Uh, probably checked in on occasion. Uh, but that didn't mean that Mary was without resources herself. The death of a father, stepfather, half-brother, and mother had left Mary with some property. In fact, roughly 1,000 acres of land. And that appears to be where Mary finished growing up. 
she was to what we would call uh, today, she was a tomboy. She rode horses, loved to ride horses. At one time she owned three. She learned how to handle a gun. She also saw her farm being managed, being administered by at least one overseer and some foreman, maybe more than that. But she saw something about farm plantation management and it stuck. Now, I have not said anything about social graces. I have not said anything about polish. She didn't have any. She was pretty rough hewn. And she goes into the marriageable ages, uh, roughly 18 through 21, you expected every young lady by then, by when they got into that period, to select a husband and become married. Mary cruises through that period, and at the ripe old age of 23, she, in 1731, she marries Augustine Washington. Now, we've already described Mary. Washington is 36 years old, and he has three half-grown children. He apparently owns a large amount of property and has almost no money. He was no catch. Mary was no catch either. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, you've heard about marriages being made in heaven. I think this is a marriage that was made in Eskridge's law office. Uh, and it, it, it began. It began uh, with Mary learning something about married life that what had happened to that point could not teach her. Specifically, she was married in 1731. She gave birth in 1732, 1733, 1734, 1736, 1738, and 1739. Welcome to married life. Now, not only was she in the process of birthing and raising a family, Augustine was also picking his family up and moving it a couple of times. They began in a house on uh, Pope's Creek, uh, just off of the Potomac. Now, this is a modern image that you're looking at here with a much, very substantial house. The frame home that Augustine and Mary lived in, that they called Wakefield, burned shortly after they left. They left there in 1835 and moved to a piece of high ground overlooking Little Hunting Creek, again, off of the Potomac. Now you take a look at that and you say, hey, that's Mount Vernon. Yes, it is. When Lawrence Washington, Augustine's son by his first marriage, inherited that property and began building the Mount Vernon house, he incorporated Augustine's and Mary's house into the Mount Vernon house. They stayed there until 1738. And in 1738, they moved to a property directly across the Rappahannock River from the town of Fredericksburg. Locally, people called it the Strother Place. Uh, the Washingtons themselves called it the Home Place. Looking across this field, you see the line of trees in the background. Just beyond those trees, the ground slopes away very steeply to the Rappahannock River, where there's a farm dock and uh, a matching dock on the Fredericksburg side just across the river. And a ferry operated between those two docks, and over time, that property became known as Ferry Farm. But to the Washingtons, it was the home place. And it was pretty well understood that the Washingtons could afford the basic necessities of life, but not a whole lot else. Uh, and and uh, it, it, was, uh, it, it was a hard living. 
But then in 1743, Augustine did a nice thing for Mary and the children. He died. <laughs> now, uh, Mary, uh, now free of marriage, assesses her situation, and she knows how to run that farm, and she actually is coming out of this marriage with less property uh, than she went into it, uh, and uh, she decides that married life is not for her, and she's going to run that farm herself. Now, one of the first things she does is glom onto her eldest child, George, named for George Eskridge. She gloms onto George and instructs him. George, at this point, uh, is, is uh, not, even, not even a teenager. Uh, George, at this point, uh, is, is uh, listening to his mother somewhat. And she is telling him that it is his duty, his bound duty, from now on for the rest of his life to help his mother in anything that she is doing and to see to her comfort in her old age. That's not what George has in mind. People who got around George at a young age could feel this intensity, this phenomenal, burning ambition that George possessed, that radiated, and it, 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 it impressed everyone who was around George, everyone except possibly Mama. <laughs> and running Mama's farm was not in George's agenda. And George looked for ways to get off of that farm as quick as he could. And what you're looking at there is a rather huge tract of property. And at age 14, George joins a survey crew that surveys the western boundary of that property. Some little over 75 miles uh, of survey line. And back in those days, you had to drag the chain. Uh, you couldn't stand on a hilltop and then survey from point to point and figure out the figure at the base of the angle. You walked the line. It was arduous. It was hacking your way through trackless wilderness. Uh, it was an experience that grown men uh, had never gotten before. And there was George, 14 years old, in there with him, meeting some of the most prominent members of the Virginia colony, and also meeting the Fairfaxes, uh, creating uh, connections that he would uh, need, he would use for the rest of his life. And somewhere in the middle of all of this, a messenger comes with a message from Mama. <laughs> How in the world they ever caught up with George, I don't know. But the message read, while you're out there gallivanting around, I want you to buy me this and this and this and this and find me a good yard man. Now, I think Mama probably knew that George didn't have a snowball chance of doing anything that message implied, but she just wanted to remind him that he was supposed to be home taking care of his mother. Uh, that did not make too good of an impression. George kept leaving the farm as much as he could. Now, ultimately, Mary makes one more move in 1772 uh, into the town of Fredericksburg, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that's her last move. That's the Mary Washington home that uh, Fredericksburg, as you can see, uh, has, has uh, proudly displayed for years. This, again, uh, is an artist's conception. No likeness for, likenesses from life. And uh, looks very dignified, and I hope she was. Uh, died of breast cancer um, in 1787 and um, I picked on her a little bit but let me tell you she made sure that George had at least as much of an education as she had she made sure that George was not a drunkard a liar or a thief 
she did one phenomenal thing. Of course, she taught George to ride, by the way, and that, that paid off handsomely with Lord Fairfax, who loved to hunt, hunt foxes. Uh, but probably the best thing that Mama did for us was when she learned that young George was contemplating joining the British Navy. George was highly influenced by half-brother Lawrence, uh, who was uh, in the military, and uh, Lawrence and Lord Fairfax had advised uh, George that if he wanted to get into the British Navy, they could grease the skids and get him in there. It wouldn't be too hard to do. Well, Mama somehow found out about it. And she got a hold of George and she told him in no uncertain terms he wasn't going to do that. And it stuck, uh, fortunately, because I'm not sure how the American Revolution would have panned out if George was a lieutenant on a British man of war when the Revolution started. Uh, I think it could have been greatly different. Next, Martha. Martha Dandridge, the Dandridge Plantation was on the Pamaki River, uh, and just downstream was the Custis home plantation. And in 1749, 17, not quite 17 year old Martha Dandridge was being courted by 38 year old Daniel Park Custis. Now, 38 years old, and you know the times. Okay, so he's a widower, a few children, looking for a second wife. No, Daniel's never been married. How can that be? Well, you have to reflect back on John Custis IV, his father. John Custis has been phenomenally successful, enormously wealthy and property. In fact, he owns five plantations, one of which was Arlington, where the National Cemetery is now. You take all five of those plantations, if you could get them together, they'd cover 24 square miles. It's a lot of land. He also has extensive business interests and widespread investments. And Daniel, Daniel is his only son. And the, every time Daniel looked at a woman twice, John Custis would go off. She is totally unacceptable. She's a tramp. She's a gold digger. You marry that girl, I'll cut you off without a penny. And Daniel would slink off and that would be the end of the relationship. Well, here we are. And, and uh, 17, 1749, fall of 1749, 38-year-old Daniel is going to try one more time. Martha's getting ready to turn 17. John Custis is getting himself worked into a lather. He's getting ready to jump on this one. But then John Custis has a change of heart. Oh, to put it more accurately, it stopped. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the next spring, Daniel and Martha were married. Now, it was, by all accounts, a successful, comfortable marriage. It produced four children, sadly, two of whom died quite young. Then, in 1757, sadly, Daniel dies. Now, Let's walk through this one more time. John Custis, 24 square miles, investments, business interests. Only son, Daniel, gets it all. Daniel dies. Martha and two kids get it all. Between what Martha inherits and acquires in her own name and what she is administering for the two children, she is handling more wealth than any other woman in North America and George Washington's knocking on her door. <laughs> it's a marriage 
actually arranged more than anything else by the two of them. She has all of this property, all of this wealth, all of these arrangements. George has already shown he's competent to do that, competent to work with that. He learned a lot from his mother about plantation management, and he's picked up more since then. Getting to be a little bit of a hero in the, um, uh, in, in the various wars that are going on. And, uh, and, and uh, it is, they, they meet each other, and, and Martha has phenomenal social contacts through the carriage. And George needs those. So it's a, it's a meeting of mutual needs. There's also a whole lot of mutual respect. And those two things, when they stick around together with a pair of people long enough, it turns into love. Because that is really the basis of love. When you need the other person, you respect the other person, they need you, they respect you, sooner or later, there's love. So we get a marriage early in 1759 and when you have as much money as Martha, the fact that you don't have wedding photographers back then doesn't make much difference. You just have somebody paint a portrait. And there it is. That's a wedding portrait. You'll see Martha with the two surviving children and, and an anxious George. Uh, I assume they are married by then though. Um, and again, it is a very comfortable, supporting relationship. Uh, it does not produce any children, unfortunately. Uh, but the two of them uh, know and trust and help each other. Now, Martha's actually something of a homebody. Uh, she likes Mount Vernon and she likes staying there. And George has set things up with overseers and counselors and advisors and the bankers and the whole business, and uh, basically the plantations are running themselves. And that's pretty darn good because in 1775, George leaves Mount Vernon and he will not see it again until 1781, six years later. He's gone all of that time. He does, however, every time the army goes into winter quarters, during the American Revolution, he would send a message to Martha and ask her if she could come, please, to be with him uh, while the army was encamped in winter quarters. And she went every time. Uh, it was ten awful days on the road, for example, to get to Valley Forge. Uh, but she, she did so. Now, uh, as I say, Martha supported George with the through the revolution, through the presidency. Uh, and then in 1799, George dies. Martha goes into a decline, slow but steady decline, and dies in 1802. She contributed probably as much as Mary uh, to the real beginnings of George. Now, this is Sister Betty second born, and her contributions are less obvious. But if you reflect on the fact that George is leaving the farm as many times for as long as he can, and this is number two, Mama gloms on to Betty. And now she's stepping and fetching and doing everything that had been expected of George as much as she can do. It's not surprising then that Betty marries at age 16. She is, uh, she, she'd like to get a little distance. She doesn't get much distance because she marries a Fredericksburg native. But the interesting thing is the level at which she married. She married Fielding Lewis and he was a widower with three children. And the Lewis family, the mercantile manufacturing family of Fredericksburg, uh, was well known uh, up and down the East Coast. And that was back when Fredericksburg was a major mercantile manufacturing 
facility when ocean-going ships were still getting to the docks at Fredericksburg. And Fielding and uh, Betty settled in. Uh, not only did he own the mercantile business, in fact, the uh, 1749 Lewis store in Fredericksburg is believed by many to be the oldest mercantile establishment standing in America. And Fielding also had a plantation, had a farm. And um, one of the more obvious things that Betty did was to get Fielding to sell George this house on Charles Street in Fredericksburg uh, for Mary. This was 1772 and by then running the farm was getting to be a little bit much for Mary and getting her into town letting overseers run the farm that was the way to do it. Now the Lewises at the same time or very shortly thereafter started building a grand home on the high ground just above this little house. Uh, it was completed in 1775. It was subsequently named Kenmore. Uh, we don't seem to know what the Lewises called it, but uh, Mr. Gordon in 1819 who owned the property uh, named the house Kenmore. And depending on the architectural historian that uh, is talking, this house has the most beautiful interiors in America or the top in the top 10 or top 20, 25. It's, it, it, I've been in there. It is awesome. Uh, unfortunately, the timing was not real good. 1775 and the revolution gets really underway the next year. Fielding is a staunch, staunch supporter uh, of the revolution, of the revolutionary government. And he does everything that he can to supply, to equip. Uh, in fact, he has a musket factory. Anybody who owns a musket that was made in Fredericksburg has got a real collector's item. Uh, but it was Fielding Lewis's factory. The only problem was Fielding Lewis was dealing with a deadbeat creditor who would not pay its bills. It was called the Commonwealth of Virginia. <laughs> and this is 1781, end of the revolution. Fielding Lewis is going to have to declare bankruptcy. And the bankruptcy proceedings are underway and Fielding Lewis dies. No opportunity to make a recovery. Betty loses virtually everything she does have a comfortable place to stay uh, in Fredericksburg, uh, but all of, most all of the Lewis properties are gone. But one of the things that she did do um, before the properties, uh, before she lost these properties, was to arrange a burial place for her mother. Um, if you were standing at the Kenmore House, this grave site would be about 200 yards to your left. Uh, this, there's a rock there that's called a meditation rock or a prayer rock. Apparently, uh, Mary Ball, Washington, loved to go and sit there and look at the view and uh, contemplate her life. And she uh, wanted to be buried there and, and was, thanks to Betty. That pretty much finishes Betty and there she is. Sally Carey Fairfax. This girl is a piece of work. She is. She's one of the four daughters of Wilson Carey who is one of the wealthy profited James River planters and Mr. Carey uh, ascribed to the same uh, philosophy that Thomas Jefferson did about educating daughters. Mm -hmm. Looking over the available male population in the colony, it was likely your daughter was going to marry, as Jefferson said, a blockhead. 
And uh, so your daughter better be prepared to take care of herself. And Mr. Carey saw to it for all four of his daughters. Sally could write, read, and speak French. She could quote accurately poets, Roman poets from the days of the Caesars, and modern-day English philosophers and scientists. And we're talking about somebody who's 17 years old. Uh, she was an avid and very competent flower gardener. And you see her holding that rose up there beside, she was pretty, and she's holding that rose up beside her face, daring you to say which is prettier. Because she had a wit, she had a humor, she could slice you and dice you and leave you in a heap. Uh, I mean, she was something. She was colonial aristocracy. She was one of the best that Virginia could offer at that time. And what did she do among the numerous suitors that she had? She chose to marry George William Fairfax the Younger. So she is colonial aristocracy and she is looking to marry into a titled and propertied British family. It isn't going to get to a much higher level than that. Now, titled and propertied. Let's take you back to this big green blob one more time. That's the thing, the western boundary, uh, the boundary you see on your left, that George helped survey when he was 14 years old. That thing is called the Northern Neck Proprietary. And it was a crown grant by the individual who became King Charles II. And by dint of marriage and inheritance, the Fairfax family had been steadily acquiring the title to that property. <clears throat> and after a court case in 1745 challenging that title, it was ruled and confirmed by the king that Thomas Fairfax, the sixth Baron of Cameron, the person a lot of Virginians call Lord Fairfax, Thomas Fairfax owned all of that property in his own name, 5,282,000 acres. Just a little place in the country. <laughs> uh, and Fairfax himself was tied up in England and uh, couldn't come over here to administer this property. So he got an older cousin, George William Fairfax, who was working in the customs department of some jurisdiction in the uh, New England colonies to come down and take the same type of job in Virginia and administer these properties. And George William came and uh, the first thing he did was build a grand residence on the Potomac River, uh, which was both a residence and a business office for the proprietary, called it Belvoir. And the ruins, the remains of this house are inside of Fort Belvoir today. Not much remains, but what there is is inside of Fort Belvoir. George William also brings his family, and among them, is George William the Younger. Now we call him the Younger. He was born in 1724. He's almost seven years older than George Washington. He adores George Washington. He seeks George's advice on matters, follows his lead, basically is overawed by this ambitious young colonial militia man already, backwoodsman, surveyor, explorer. I don't know. I, I think we may have found one of Miss Jefferson's blockheads. I'm not sure. Because <laughs> uh, we don't hear much about him after that, uh, except that late in Lord Fairfax's life, George William is openly campaigning to inherit that property. 
and Lord Fairfax makes a point to bypass him and go to another person. And that was when George left America for England. Well, uh, we get back to Sally and George. Now, uh, Sally marries uh, George William in 1747. They spend the winter on the James River at the Cary Plantation and move up the Potomac to Belvoir in the spring of 1748. And very shortly thereafter, George Washington, 16 years old, is visiting Lawrence, which is just across the creek at Mount Vernon. He's visiting Lawrence, and at some point he rows over to Belvoir to see this woman that he's hearing so much about. Well, this woman has heard a lot about George, too. And George strides into the entrance hall of Belvoir. And at age 16, he's already still, he's already a huge human being, prodigiously strong. His reputation as a militia man, as a backwoodsman, as an explorer, all of that has, is with him, and Sally knows it all. She also knows that at this point, George has learned pretty much all of his social skills from his mother, and from militia people, and from outdoors backwoods people. He is rough as a cop. He is really unsuitable for good society. Now, she's the wife of one of George's very best friends. But she is, and I forgot to tell you this, she's also a notorious flirt. <laughs> And she turns her charms loose on George, and he turns into this little pile of putty. <laughs> <laughs> to do with as she sees fit. It's love, really. George falls in love. It'll be 11 years before he marries Martha, and he is in love. Now, Martha, and they exchange letters over the years, expressing great affection for one another, and on one occasion, George actually acknowledges that he loves her. It's a letter they ex letters they exchanged just before he married Martha. And uh, she knew that was going on, and uh, she told him, uh, she wrote him a very saucy letter, and he came back deadly serious. Uh, I do love you. Uh, now, she takes this backwoods diamond in the rough, she takes him under her wing and she starts to polish him. And she starts knocking off the rub edges, rough edges and she starts putting a shine on that boy. Learns how to, learns manners. You know, which folk? That sort of thing. Uh, playing cards. She learns, she teaches him to dance. Probably took all of the Fairfax women, their feet had to recover from being stomped on. Uh, so they probably danced with him in shifts until he finally got straight. Uh, but George loved dancing from then on. That was, a, that was a, uh, just a totally enjoyable parlor exercise uh, that George enjoyed for the rest of his life. And, and uh, George, in fact, in years later, you see her with the rose, George, in fact, years later, is mailing her seeds for her, for her garden. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, very cute relationship. But what is going on uh, is, that, is that Sally is creating the man that Martha will marry. She teaches George, I think one of the most important things, communicating, written and verbal, written and oral, and how you communicated to people above your station, below your station, how you communicated to your peers, what words you could use, what words you couldn't use, uh, and particularly <laughs> at the peer level, when you were communicating with your 
friends. Those communications, if you get a chance to read some, they are loaded with sexual innuendos. Uh, it's almost light porn uh, in some cases, and you had to be careful who you were talking to. And, and uh, George got all that figured out. It basically was a finishing school for George Washington. And many, many, many thanks to Sally, many thanks to Betty, many thanks to Martha, many thanks to Mary. We got the George Washington that we know of history. Thank you for your attention.